Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, Essential Metadata Strategy, sponsored today by Top Quadrant. It is the latest installment in a monthly series called Data Ed Online with Dr. Peter Aiken. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag data ed. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And to open and access either the Q&A or the chat panels, you may find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen. And just to note, the Zoom chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to chat with everyone throughout. To answer the most commonly asked questions, as always, we will send a follow-up email to all registrants within two business days, containing links to the slides. And yes, we are recording and will likewise send a link of the recording of the session, as well as any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me turn it over to Jesse for a brief word from our sponsor, Top Quadrant. Jesse, hello and welcome. Hi, Shannon, and thank you everyone for joining us today. I work for Top Quadrant as a semantic solutions architect and we're going to jump right in with a set of questions. <clears throat> so first, we need to ask, what is active metadata management because of the title here? And according to Gartner, that is an emerging set of capabilities resulting from continuous metadata management innovation. That's what we're here to talk about, is that continuous journey. Next slide. It all begins with metadata. And the best definition and explanation of that is going to be given to us by Peter and not to steal any of his thunder, but um, I've stolen one of his slides by screenshotting it and pasting it here um, because <clears throat> it is such a relevant description for us at Top Quadrant. Um, it basically says the who, what, where, when, how, and whys of data are individual statements about the data, which is basically moves us to the next part of the path. Next slide. And that is to say, okay, we went from metadata to data catalogs, but what is a data catalog? And I love this description here that, that I'm going to give you, which is your metadata catalog or your data catalog in general are all of those metadata statements just brought together to serve a purpose. And that purpose is or are the data stakeholders, sort of a one-stop shop, if you will. <clears throat> and it's important that all of these facts, it's not just that they're just in one place or centralized, it's that they're understood and most importantly, connected. <clears throat> Next slide. Now, the, the connections are the most important, I said, so how do those connections happen? And this is where we start getting into this idea of a data or metadata model. The model describes the relationships between the data assets and the secondary components. Here we see an example that's describing a data set and it's not a specific data set. This is the model. So this is what is allowed to be said about a data set inside of your data catalog. Next slide. So if we can describe a data catalog things like data sets and databases inside of your catalog. And we can cover the idea of controlled vocabularies. We're really getting someplace now. So the data catalog has the ability to describe your first class citizens, but also the second class citizens. And those are the controlled vocabularies. And these are everything from business glossaries to simple enumerations. For example, here, a common list of formats. The more we speak in common controlled vocabularies, the better. Next slide. So with the model in place that is giving us instruction, guidance, and an understanding, and the controlled vocabularies in place, we can start stringing real statements, actual statements together. And once you can do this, you have something ready to be automated, enriched, governed, consumed, which are really what you're ultimately doing what you're doing for. And if, if you like where we're getting here, you'll enjoy the next bit, which is on the next slide, Shannon, which is to ask the question, what is a knowledge graph? And that's what Top Quadrant does. Our software is all based on knowledge graph semantic web standards. 
And the best way to answer what is a knowledge graph is to say that you'll want to do all of those previous steps that I used as an example of building up a data catalog. It's just you've decided to do it as a knowledge graph, which means you've decided to use semantic graph standards to formally describe your assets. And why would you want to make this decision? Next slide. Knowledge graphs align with Gartner's view that we began with, that metadata management requires continuous innovation and what I believe they also call a connected enterprise. Knowledge graphs are a flexible, standards-based, non-black box, highly integratable metadata solution. And adaptable is another software virtue that could be added to this list. And I hope that maybe got some gears turning and gets you thinking because the next leap in the journey, if we've gone all the way from metadata to a metadata catalog or a data catalog, we're talking about knowledge graphs here now and we need to make that next jump, which is really adapting to the future. So if you are just getting started with metadata management, following Peter's great experience and recommendations, you want to be sure that you're on the right path to be able to sustain and evolve your metadata strategy. And that may just be to the point that we just got, or it may actually be that your future could be what is now called a data fabric. Next slide, Shannon. Gartner defines data fabric as a design concept that serves as an integrated layer fabric of data and connecting processes. They liken it to a self-driving car, but for your data. So you can see it's bigger than, um, you know, it's architectural, it's design strategy. It's bigger than just a data catalog or a knowledge graph. But on the next slide, Shannon, there's a strong belief that the smarts of a knowledge graph based data catalog, which was the journey that I took you on, is needed in order to support this emerging architecture. Next slide, Shannon. And we at Top Quadrant believe that our top grade edge enterprise data governance solution, which is based on knowledge graphs, has been designed for this exciting future for everyone in the metadata world. But we also believe that it's ready for you to start using on day one because it can evolve and grow with you very organically as a metadata system and allows you to build your metadata and data catalog following open semantic web standards and establishing you for that future, which may be something like Gartner's data fabric. So let us know if you're interested in Top Rate Edge for modeling, vocabulary management, metadata management, or if you just want more information. So have a great day and we're back to you, Shannon and Peter. Jesse, thank you so much for this great presentation. And uh, if you have questions for Jesse or about Top Quadrant, you may submit them in the Q&A portion of your screen. We will be, um, Jesse will be joining us in the Q&A portion at the end of Peter's presentation. And now let me introduce this uh, series speaker, Peter Aiken. Peter is an internationally recognized data management thought leader. Many of you know, already know him or have seen him at conferences worldwide. He has more than 30 years of experience and has received many awards for his outstanding contributions to the profession. He has written dozens of articles and now 12 books. His most recent just released is Data Literacy, Achieving Higher Productivity for Citizens, Knowledge Workers, and Organizations. Congratulations, Peter, on your latest book. Peter is experienced with more than 500 data management practices in 20 countries and consistently named as a top management expert. Some of the most important and largest organizations in the world have sought out his expertise. Peter has spent multi-year immersions with groups as diverse as the US Department of Defense, Deutsche Bank, Nokia, Wells Fargo, and the Commonwealth of Virginia and Walmart. And with that, let me turn everything over to Peter to get his presentation started. Hello and welcome. Welcome to you, Shannon. And Jesse, thank you for a great intro on here. And you're right, that is a, there's so much happening in the area of metadata that it's, it's just sad to see how little 
that people actually know they can utilize as they're going forward on this. Uh, so when we bring Jesse back, I'm sure he'll talk a little bit more about some of the, the latest things that have been coming out there. But the knowledge graph area in particular is a very fruitful area. And the organizations that are not exploring this uh, really run the risk of falling behind in this area. So what we're going to talk about today is really defining metadata in the context of data management. Unfortunately, most people define it, I think, a little bit different than perhaps Jesse and I will uh, on this. And the question is, would we really want to do with metadata? Well, the answer is leverage something. And the reason you leverage something is, of course, to add value to it. I'm going to start out by hitting you with a very quick example early on that uses iTunes, or in their case, Apple renamed it the Apple Music app, but so that you can see this and most importantly, teach it to others uh, as they need to learn about it, specifically your boss's boss when your boss's boss says, I don't understand this metadata. We're going to look at four specific strategies. The first one is that metadata is a gerund, do not treat it as a noun. That is, metadata is a use of data rather than a type of data. The second strategy is to enforce metadata to be the language of data governance. When I work with organizations that are having trouble with their data governance, it is typically because they are not speaking from the same language or understanding, as Jesse said uh, in his little presentation on that. Uh, it is very critical that that understanding take place. Strategy number three is to treat glossaries, repositories as capabilities, not as technology. And I'm sure Jesse will agree on that one when he gets back here. Cyclical approaches tend to start out in a way that the organization can crawl, walk, and run their way towards success on this. And finally, the fourth one is that there's a lot of good first piece building blocks that are out there. We'll go through very quickly a number of them, but I've said many, many, many uh, in there just to make sure that point is uh, reinforced. We'll finish up with the sort of a summary of the benefits, uh, the applications and the sources around this to understand that metadata defines the essence of organizational interoperability. Finish up uh, right at uh, 3 p.m. with some takeaways and references and look forward to the Q&A session. Let's dive right in. We start out with defining it, of course. And in the history of language, when two words were pasted together to form an initial concept, we started out with a hyphen. Even our dim mock at DEMA is hyphenated with it. It's done. It's now the passage of time says that the hyphen can be lost, and we should use the word metadata. And that's important because, again, just trying to do a search on it, you wouldn't want to have to search for all three of those terms. Anything that's relevant that's happening is happening with the term metadata without it. Uh, interesting also, there was a copyright granted by the US government to somebody on the term metadata, kind of like the joke that Microsoft owns all the zeros and ones now. Uh, disregard it, it's absolutely irrelevant and has been um, uh, uh, thoroughly uh, uh, discredited in that area. So it used to be that if you said metadata, they were afraid somebody would come out and sue you. Well, let's start by talking about getting agreement. And it's very difficult in many cases because many people who are working with data see it from just one perspective. Again, the blind man and the elephant, it's a fan, it's a snake, it's a tree, it's a rope, it's a wall, and of course they're all correct. Unfortunately, we've been working on our definition of data management around that as well, and it's also been a little bit tough. Perhaps some of you all will be able to jump in and help. Uh, that's not what our discussion is for, but if you've got better ideas on this, we're all looking. The idea is we used to say that data management is everything that happens between when data is acquired and when data is used. The problem is that's a little bit squishy and it also doesn't include the idea that we're reusing data largely. Uh, again, there's not much point in putting something in a repository if you don't plan to go back and get it later on. So we've been working on a different definition here, which is to say that there are things on the sourcing side, typically falling into a data engineering category, but that uh, require specialized skills, and that there are also things on the exploitation side. These, again, hit us in a way that's very, very useful. And now we can say, oh, you're looking at it from an evaluation perspective or from a presentation perspective, but none of these still hit on what we're trying to do with data for the most part, which is reuse it. And we are not really well studied as far as how to formally reuse data management. Uh, we're looking at it from a, a number of different perspectives. Uh, again, the knowledge graphs area seems to indicate that we can use the metadata about the metadata, <gasps> meta metadata around all of this to start figuring out access patterns and things. And again, that's something we can dive into a little bit more 
before. But our, our focus here is really going to be on preparation and delivery in these cases here. So when people are looking at data, they're looking at it from different perspectives and only seeing part of what's actually going on in the metadata world. Uh, if we go straight to the dictionary and what does meta mean, the, the fourth definition up here, beyond transcending, more comprehensive, and at a higher state of development are all great ways to think about this. And if you go to metadata's origins, which of course are the card catalogs of the libraries. I know that those of you that are too young don't know what a library is, much less a card catalog. So when you were doing research in the old days, you would go to the library, you would access the card catalog, you would flip through these three by five index cards and try to find things that were interesting. And these three by five index cards kept all sorts of information about the books. Uh, you can see these are just some examples that are here. And then you would write down the number of the book, the key, and go find the book in the library. So this leads us to, I think, a very good starting place for a definition of data about your data. Now, that's technically true. And if you think even more carefully about this, it means that you should manage data with the same good data management practices and techniques that you already apply to your data. So there's a very nice complementariness between the two of these. If you're having trouble looking about your organization and figuring out where it is, like you don't have a library, one thing almost all organizations do have is networks. And these networks have a group of people in there that keep track of where the wires go, what devices are permitted to log on, access points, all sorts of other things, and usually ends up being a named individual, as in Peter Aiken is the person who maintains the access list so that we can determine who can come onto our network and not. This group within your networking group is practicing metadata already. They're not doing it about data, they're doing about networking access points, but nevertheless, what they are doing is still the access of metadata. I mentioned that the reason that you want to do this is because leverage is an engineering concept. And if I'm trying to balance these two pieces here, you can see that 100 kilograms and one kilogram just don't work. But if I understand a little bit about the laws of physics, I can improve the weight on the right-hand side and perhaps it will balance if I have the right length of the ruler. If I go to too many, I will get up with an unbalanced situation. And the key to this is that this holistic approach to data management works the same way. You've got some organizational data, you've got some technologies that you use. Again, many people are not very familiar with the technologies, so I urge you to, to follow up uh, with Jesse and, and, and the others and, and the events that are around this and learn as much as you can about these technology pieces because they are truly exciting. Uh, if we go to data and people, we also need to have our group of knowledge workers supported by data professionals. And of course, we need, if we're going to put people and technology together, a process to tie them together. And that process is the leveraging that we are describing. Think of this as a three-legged stool. You cannot sit comfortably on a two-legged stool, so a three-legged stool is necessary. Similarly here, people process and technology, and that process, of course, is driven by strategy. So metadata should be focused on helping organizations do better with their data. And if you watch that slide carefully, you may have to go back and watch it on rerun. I, uh, I also put in a little bit there that says, if you've reduced the size of the organizational data, uh, it helps to increase your data leverage. We'll get into that in just a little bit. But metadata is a primary means of applying leverage or adding value to your existing sets of data. And this multi-use concept permits organizations to manage your data within the organization, but also with your various data exchange partners, and most importantly, in support of the mission, because if you're not supporting the mission with your data, you're missing out on potential resources that can help. The leverage obtained by metadata is the idea that we're trying to get more data centric, or uh, I like to call it the data doctrine on this, and focusing in on non rot data. And I've used that acronym twice. It means data that is redundant, obsolete, or trivial. In other words, it just gets in the way. The bigger the organization, 
greater potential leverage exists in here. And treating data more asset-like simultaneously reduces IT costs somewhere between 20 and 40% and increases organizational knowledge worker productivity up to a possible uh, upward theoretical uh, number that we've come up with of about 18%. So imagine if you could lower your IT costs and increase your knowledge worker productivity. That's a tremendous opportunity here. This bit about rot is all about separating the wheat from the chaff. And in the past, we've had to argue that well-organized data is worth more, but some people still demand some sorts of proof here. So I'm leaving you with an example. And, and that's the purpose of this, of course, is to give you all these opportunities. You can either replay these from uh, the YouTube videos that we put out at the end of the session here, or use these slides and repurpose them uh, yourself. But just in terms of pre-information age metadata, we would take a book and we would number the pages we would put the index in alphabetic order. There were all sorts of things here. And if you have uh, more desire to learn about that, there's a wonderful series of examples here from Abby Covert, who is a non-technical information architect and has written a wonderful book called How to Make Sense Out of Any Mess. Now, the key is, of course, if I take the cover off the book, the spine off of it and push these things out and throw the pages away. Well, the knowledge of course disappears, which means that somebody is going to have to recreate it, which is why in our organizations, so many are spending time messing with the data that is redundant, obsolete or trivial. And the question is, which data do I eliminate? Because most data has never been analyzed in organizations. So metadata actually yields valuable information about your data sets. Do we have this specific class of data sets? We can say yes or no. What is the quality of something? And we can say it's suitable or unsuitable. Again, these are things that you can do with the technology that uh, Jesse was describing. And what cost will be to improve this class of data assets? Well, if I can improve them for 35 cents a piece and I have a thousand of them, we've got a pretty good idea of the cost. If I have a hundred thousand of them, we have a different idea of the cost. And can these data assets be provided more granularly? And the answer typically is no, if it wasn't designed into it in the first place. Metadata, as I mentioned before, we spelled it incorrectly in the DIMBOK in the last version of it. Uh, we'll get that corrected in the next one, but you can see it is in the upper left-hand corner there with the yellow surrounding it, talking about one of 11 practice areas that comprise the discipline of, meta, of data management. And metadata management here, again, is an input-output chart. I'm certainly not going to read you everything here, but it's a really nice little piece to print out by your desk and just put up there showing the inputs, the processes, the outputs, the goals, the activities, the participants, everybody who's involved in this. Now, I mentioned I was going to go into straight example here. Uh, this package used to be called iTunes. It existed on Windows as well as on Macintosh platforms, it's now called music uh, in here. But the, the process is still the same. If I took a CD, again, those of you that are younger, that was the way we used to listen to music. We would put a CD into our computer CD reader, and it would present information like this, which was not terribly useful. What did the metadata that was on each CD contain? Well, in this case, it was the, um, excuse me, the um, specifically number of tracks and how long each track was. It's not very much metadata. So how did it get to where we are? Well, it turns out somebody, a company called Grace Note, put in a little bit of a query and said, you guys can come look at us and we'll take a digital fingerprint off of each um, CD and we'll maintain this one collection here so that everybody else doesn't have to type all that data in each time. Again, CD name, artist, track names, genre, artwork, all of these things come from Grace Note, which happens pretty much seamlessly when you stuck a CD into this music package. Now you can see here I'm looking at a Miles Davis uh, recording here and I'm going to put my Miles Davis recordings together. So by the way you can see how old this example is my iPhone was a version 4 at that point in time. Uh, but anyway uh, we can do a special piece using the metadata in here that has now been provided and augments our existing collection and say I'd like to have a selection of a new smart playlist that contains just data from Miles Davis. So this helps us organize all of this information. Again, this is all out there. You can do this yourself, follow along if you want, et cetera, et cetera. The only problem was, of course, you can see here on the left-hand side, there's my Miles Davis um, folder that I've got, my, my smart playlist, but I've now got 
twice as much Miles Davis in there as I thought I did because I had another Miles Davis CD in my iTunes collection that I had forgotten about. I didn't get the desired results. I already had another recording and I need to fine tune it. Now it's not just Miles Davis uh, in this case, but I want to have Miles Davis in a particular folder uh, in order to do this. All of this metadata, of course, allows me to make playlists that are comprised of jazz or pop or whatever it is that I'm looking to get a hold of in this. And most importantly, this architecture for the play scaled. So the iTunes metadata was exactly the same. Interface, processing, and data structures that were applied to podcasts, movies, books, PDF files, and many other things that were out there. They eventually decided this was complex and broke it back apart again. But the nice part was that it worked really well for about 10 years. And the economies of scale, when you build something like this, are critically enormous. So once again, metadata yields valuable information about your assets. Do we have these specific Miles Davis recordings? Yes, indeed. Uh, most, what is my most played Miles Davis recording? Uh, again, a particular song pops up. What will it cost to improve this class of data assets? If I had low fidelity recordings, uh, if somebody comes along and tempts me and says for two cents a piece for each song, you can go to high definition quality recordings recordings, and that might be very nice uh, worthwhile. I, can I listen to the entire album before dinner might be a reasonable question, and not easily in this case, because it's a live recording that's almost two hours long. So that's the context and the teachable example here. Let's dive into the strategies. Uh, those of you that are not familiar with English grammar, and I'm terrible at it, but I did learn enough about it to, to work it this way. Uh, as Jesse said, comprehension by others is critical. If others do not understand what you do, then you are perceived as a cost to the organization. Whereas if they do understand what you do, it's easier for them to understand the value. I'm going to show you the origin of that slide that Jesse used in there came from Walmart. And not even for me, a colleague, Brad Melton, that I was working with at the time out there, came up with this as Walmart was going through part of this journey. It was a wonderful piece. And he said, look at this. Data is, as Jesse said, a combination of any circle and any data that unlocks that value. I'm sorry, I went too fast on that piece. I'm going to go back just to make sure that you can see it uh, when we do the recordings for it. But again, thank you, Brad. Even though it's been 10 years, I uh, hope to hear from you soon uh, around all of that. It was a great uh, piece of insight that he had. Another one, of course, is your Outlook inbox. Imagine if your Outlook inbox didn't have stuff broken out by subject, priority, user ID, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It would be very, very difficult. For example, if my boss sends me something uh, important, I I need to be able to put it in a high priority boss. Imagine working with Outlook and all you had was a bunch of email. It would be dreadful and complex. And we've already determined, uh, again, it's a little factoid in the new book, but if we had better email management capabilities, we could save the typical knowledge worker 14 days each year. I believe that's the right number. I may have to look that up. Maybe it's 10, but that's certainly an awful lot of time that we spend because we don't have the easiest to use metadata facilities. So metadata is, of course, involved in every data management activity, and it's integral to all applications. Data reflects real life. Metadata reflects the data transactions that occur in there. And those transactions uh, that occur describe the structure and workings of an organization's use of information. Uh, our friend David Hay has a wonderful book where he dives into that subject in a lot more detail. Jesse also mentioned a Gartner definition. I'm going to go back uh, about well, exactly 10 years. And one of Mark Gartner's definitions at the time, and I think they still use it, is that metadata unlocks the value of data. And therefore, it requires management attention because there's a value component to it. I like that definition a lot, and I use it all the time. Metadata management, then, is the set of processes that, that uh, ensure proper creation, storage, integration of all the things that we need to have. So you're, of course, all wondering, what is a gerund? Well, a gerund is a <clears throat> the idea that it's a verb that functions as a noun. And I think that works really well in this case. It really isn't a noun because what happens is if you look around for metadata to store, people start pointing to things and say, is that metadata? And that's the last thing you want everybody doing because it confuses things. The answer is, 
any piece of data can also be used as metadata depending on the circumstances. So instead of looking at things and saying, is that metadata and therefore should I put it in the tool that I'm working with, you should instead say, is this data that I'm now creating worth including in the scope of our metadata practices? Or does it fall under that rot stuff that Peter was talking about last week when I watched his webinar? Let me show you a quick use of this. Uh, again, very old materials here, but this is really how new this stuff is. So we published a paper uh, in uh, one of the journals a while back that talked specifically about using metadata when we were in putting in new systems. It's a terrific paper. Uh, it's out there on the web. You can certainly get a hold of it uh, on that. But Here's just an example. This was implementing PeopleSoft, which some of you know is a big ERP. And when they looked at PeopleSoft, they said, we're putting in three modules, develop workforce, administer workforce, and compensate employees. You can see those comprise the majority of things that are there in this module. They bought some other things that would monitor workforce to find business, blah, blah, blah. But you can look and say, okay, these are interesting. Now, the question is, what are we measuring? And I'll show you that in just a second. Uh, these are the number of different steps, process steps, that occur in each of the primary modules that we brought down. And what I'm showing here is I've blown up administer workforce to show that in this example, it's likely that recruiting workforce is more complex, complex than managing competencies. And certainly both of those are more complex than planning successions around here. So this is just a very quick way of using some metadata in a new system implementation that's also very, very helpful. Data structure problems have been difficult in the past because we've had all sorts of issues. This is a old look at an old green screen system. And you can see it's a, 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 an old uh, system at VCU that we used to use in there. And the, the example is just fantastic here because here is the data model that I made this particular class put together. They reverse engineered the system, analyzing the metadata. And if you look at it, you can see why perhaps this particular file was called the student database master. And the answer was because we had a piece up here that was a table that was literally connected in a parent-child relationship to all the other things that are on this table. This was how this particular system was used. It worked really, really well for the students. And we had a interesting uh, uh, company come and apply for us to try and replace the system that we had to get off the mainframe anyway, so it was no big deal. But they sent us their metadata for the same information that we were maintaining here. And I, I hope that with this just brief one minute explanation here, you understand that the SDBM thing in the upper left hand corner here has a link to each of these other pieces, one to many in most cases, but oftentimes one to one. You'd have to look at the, the chart here to be detailed. And when we asked the company that was proposing to replace this system with their own to send us their version of this chart here is what they sent. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out this ain't going to work. And truly, it never did. It was way too complex. They never could even tell us, was this a data model or a process model or anything else? They had no idea what they're doing, and they came very close to ending up in jail. Again, that's a drinking story sometime if you want to hear the rest of that. Uh, metadata is so important that IBM and one of its relentless, we're going to solve all the world's problems, just like they did with Watson, came up with something called AD cycle, application development cycle. And these are all the various types of metadata that can exist according to IBM. It's a great place if you want to study this and look specifically at metadata. But the real question is not is this metadata, but would we obtain value from this data? if we include it within the scope of our metadata practices. Let's move on to strategy number two, metadata must be the language of data governance. Again, that understanding is critical. Let me take you very briefly through a model of what data is. And I'm gonna tell you all just up front that 42 is not Jackie Robinson's Jersey number. It is in fact, the meaning of life, the universe and everything that will only make sense to you if you happen to read a book called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where the white mice and the dolphins turn out to be running the world with us as the experiment to create a giant supercomputer. It runs for 300 centuries and comes back and says, the answer to life, the universe, and everything is 42. And you're saying, I'm sorry, why am I wasting my time here listening to somebody talk about science fiction? Well, what I've done hopefully here is give you a fact and pair that fact with the meaning. That is the definition of data, a fact paired with a meaning. The number 42 in this case means the meaning of life. So 
if you've not learned anything else from this particular webinar, you have at least learned that the meaning of life is 42. On the other hand, we don't want to go around pairing every piece of data with all the passable facts and meanings. We only want to do that for useful data. And so the key is, can we find useful data and then distinguish that from our next level up information? And the answer to that turns out to be quite objective. Yes, if somebody requests that data, it becomes information. That is literally the piece that takes us apart from that. We have one more level that we always put on these charts, but we, we can't go forward here before we say, you can have data without information, but you can't have information without data. So it doesn't make any sense at all to try and manage them separately. Now, the last top of our pyramid here is instead of just what information is requested, how is the information actually used? And that's when it transforms from information into request. And most importantly, this structure here that's bouncing right in front of you is also a metadata structure showing how these things are all related. Let's take it a step further and let's look at it in the context of data governance. And when we look at a organizational data strategy, as I mentioned before, that is what guides your process oriented activities or tells data governance what the data assets need to do in order to support the organization's strategy. And of course, coming back out from that, we should have some how well is it working information so that we can make any corrections. Remember, our data strategy is always subordinate and only exists to support the way the organization achieves its strategic goals. In Peter's world, uh, data governance actually dictates what IT projects go forward. Uh, that's not widespread yet, but it is becoming more so. Uh, and the IT projects, of course, support the operations. We'll put in a couple of feedback loops here just to, to close the whole Whole thing together, but it's really kind of complex. So again, we'll go for a little bit of a simplification. What the data assets do to support strategy needs to be expressed in terms of business goals. If we don't tie them to something specific, again, the organization will look at you as a cost rather than as a value component. And the language of data governance has to be metadata. If you do things not focused on metadata, you will end up with confusion. People not sure why they're at this meeting or what the importance of this topic that we've been arguing about so vociferously for a while. We of course take that little strategy and pull it on down into again, the data stewards as well because they need to be on the same sheet of paper literally. So the way to think about metadata also is that it's a really lot like sheet music. And that if you're going to present a group of musicians playing something, they need to have the same sheet music in order to look at this. Let's take this, how does governance and metadata fit together just a little bit further. I like to start this slide out by saying that governance is always based on and founded in and grounded in the IT and the systems development world uh, on this. But we're going to divide this particular piece up into four quadrants here and just say that the domain expertise is on the left and the domain expertise is greater on the right. The roles are more formally defined on the left as opposed to less formally defined on the right. And the things on the top and the bottom of these lines are that the people below the lines are going to encounter data that is governed more directly. And the people on top are going to have uh, less chance to encounter governed data, but that the people below the line will have more time dedicated to that process and the people on the top less. So let's dive in a little bit further. What are the components? Well, we've got leadership, we've got stewards, we've got participants, and we've got sources. And again, the only source of coordination with them is metadata. If we draw a line around it and say that for this organization, this is what they've decided that their data governance uh, organization should look like, we can now start to put some roles in place. The leadership is responsible for obtaining resources and understanding feedback that comes from the organization, making decisions, and transferring the the implementation of those decisions to the stewards. Uh, then the stewards make sure that something happens where people take action. We make some changes. We'll probably have some additional feedback that comes in here, some additional ideas and some guidance that all comes throughout. Again, that chart's a little bit complex. So I'll give you this version of it just so that you can take it and show it to others. This is what happens and why when we're looking at it. And the only possible way to coordinate this is through careful metadata use. Or I guess the term is now, Jesse, we'll talk about it, active metadata use uh, that should be focused in on leading techniques. Metadata then yields valuable information about your, your governance processes. Do we have shared understanding of our goals? We can say yes. Are we in IT focused on similar goals? Yes. Are we being cost effective? 
perspective. Well, again, we can go back and look specifically at the numbers here and say that the supply chain area is the area we'll get our most value from, first of all. Glossaries and repositories should be treat, excuse me, I'll start over again. Glossaries and repositories should be treated as capabilities, not as technology. It's important that people understand the function and the use of these things. When you look at it, most organizations start out and say, well, let's define some things. So here's a definition of a bed, a piece of furniture used as a place to sleep or relax. Kind of nice. But now let's take an example of it. Uh, our good friend Clive, who passed uh, recently these last uh, couple weeks here, taught me the importance of the purpose statement instead of the definition because it incorporates motivation. So a purpose statement says, why is the organization maintaining this information? And in this case, we maintain the information about it because we're trying to understand what beds are all about and where there are beds existing. Uh, how many beds can be in a room? A room can have, uh, one room can have zero or multiple beds in this case. Uh, finally, another piece of important metadata is that all of your models are in a unvalidated or draft, uh, excuse me, draft status uh, before they're validated. So it's important to write that on there, and that also becomes metadata as far as your organizations go. I've had lots of organizations kind of get saved because they put draft on their models, and when management said they were out of time, they said, well, we can't be out of time because the model isn't yet validated, and the management had committed to validated models. Again, that's another story we can get into. Let me tell you a story about a really interesting organization that I worked with for a number of years, Nokia. Uh, Nokia had something that they called the Nokia Term Bank. And this was a wonderful facility that they had set up so that every employee in the organization, whenever they had a question about something, they would literally turn to their notebooks, their mobile devices, and type in this word at the Nokia Term Bank. And if it wasn't in there, it meant they didn't have Nokia-wide agreement on this particular term, but that the organization would then vote very quickly. If you're just in a meeting said, should we submit this to the organizational term bank metadata people? And uh, they built this term bank up over many, many years. It was a tremendously valuable piece. It also emphasized the need for culture around all of these terms. Because most organizations, when they start out to have conversations, the customers are not as knowledgeable as the vendors. And we have to do some things that breach this technology gap uh, that's in here and help organizations actually get smarter about what they do. And one of the ways that you can do this is by trying some metadata activities on your own. So you may or may not be familiar with a company called FTI, Financial Transactions Incorporated. They're one of the first business rules engines. And we took their main data model and reverse engineered it. They didn't think it was very useful, but I'll show you what use we made of it in a particular customer. By the way, this slide right here also shows you the metadata that you need to build your own metadata repository if management hasn't yet decided that it's a good idea for your organization to go forward. You can build this. Here is the kind of thing that you might build using Microsoft Access or Power BI or something else very similar here. This is a repository that we put together, delivered for a customer here. You can see we've selected a table called FT underscore T underscore account, and it's showing me the columns also on each column, whether they are primary or foreign keys. Now, we can also click around a little bit here and look at this and say, here's a table FT underscore T underscore ABDF, a real table, and here are the column names. Here are the uh, excuse me, I better do it this way. Here are the column details for each column. We can look at it. We can click on that primary key button or foreign key button and find out whether they pop up over there. Uh, primary key shows you what, the, what that shows up in the other places, shows up where it shows up as a foreign key. Uh, again, shows up maybe where it shows up as a column where it's neither a foreign key or whatever. This type of repository coupled with an executive who gains value from using it a critical component allows your organization now to find out more about your data assets. Do we have these specific assets? Yes or no. Is this data item used somewhere else? In this case, we can say definitively, absolutely not in this instance. What will it cost to acquire more assets? Can these be shared securely? Uh, again, not easily because of their security classification around this. And now we'll move to our fourth component on this, which is the idea as a strategy, do not start from scratch. We have so many things that we have built up as a community over the years. The vendors are all tremendously helpful about this. 
If you start from a blank sheet of paper, you'll spend a lot more time unnecessarily. So let's dive in and talk about architecture just very briefly. First of all, architecture is about describing things at a very high level of abstraction, as in things, or perhaps if you're looking at a house, perhaps doors and windows. It also talks about the function of those things. It doesn't do a whole lot of good to um, have certain doors that lead nowhere. There's actually a very famous house called the Winchester Mystery House that has doors leading to nowhere uh, on this. And so what do those things do? What are they? What do they do? And how do they interact? Now, this is a silly piece, obviously Dr. Seuss back and forth, but if you can answer those three questions, you've actually got a very good description of your architecture. And when we look at it from a data perspective, what we're seeing is, as you might expect, details are organized into larger components. The details mean that we're dealing with things that are intricate. And we need to make sure that that intricacy is preserved because that intricacy is where the business rules are stored and how organizations differentiate themselves in the marketplace. Those larger components then are organized into models and the models then indicate dependencies. You can't have one of these unless you have at least one of these other things, whatever the things are that we are specifying as we go forward. And finally, we organize those models into an enterprise architecture comprised of these various architectural components. And the last adjective that I'll add on here is purposefulness. An architecture is organized for a particular reason. In a retail situation, it's about selling stuff. In a services organization, it's about providing services. Now, we don't tend to see these things in terms of the details. We tend to see them as attributes. We tend to see them as dependencies and organized into models, and we get to the architecture. And the, the real challenge is, I showed you an example of the attributes up here, thing one and the definitions here. The, dependencies that are here in this data model, although I haven't labeled anything. And remember, a data model is always incomplete if you don't have the definitions of those uh, pieces there, which again is a really good reason why you should maintain that centrally. So that when somebody reuses a term across your data modeling environment, it is the same term that again, everybody is on the same sheet of paper. But why aren't there any examples of well, enterprise architecture models? Because they're really big and they're really complex and we have to rely on patterns. The patterns are something that allow us to understand things, even though we may not have visited them before. Probably you all have done this as well. Uh, gosh, that's really ironic. I'm popping up a piece of Perth, which is, of course, where Clive's uh, hometown was uh, on this. Uh, I'm not sure where that came from or how it happened, but uh, again, rest in peace, Clive, on that one. If you go to the restroom in any of these buildings in Perth or any large building around the world, you find out that the restrooms tend to be in the same place on each floor. Why is that the case? Well, the process of moving waste out of the building is one that relies on physical tubes and gravity. So if we're going to put physical tubes together and gravity to take stuff out of buildings that we don't want in buildings, it probably makes sense to make sure that architecture is as simple as possible. Metadata will allow you to do that, and you should hopefully see the same thing, that electrical wiring, HVAC, floor plans all fall into the same categories. In fact, when we look at these design patterns, we can start to see that they are transferable from instance to instance. For example, a big house is pretty much the same as a small house, except that it may have updated equipment or perhaps multiple instances of the equipment. Uh, again, these are very good pattern reuses and there are a bunch of these patterns out there. So you will notice here that I've got a couple of authors up again, Len Silverstein, David Marco, David Hay, uh, got some books around this that talk about, and, and I'll just give you a, a quick sense of this. Len is a wonderful person who I've uh, worked with over the years, Paul as well, uh, terrific colleagues. And, and Len, he kind of gets annoyed with me because I will only call him up when somebody calls me and says, have you ever heard of a data model that we can use for a pharmacy that's in a healthcare situation, as opposed to a pharmacy that's in a retail situation? And I can call up Len Silverstone and he'll tell me book two, page 17. And literally, if you get these books, they actually have 
uh, CDs in the back that have the metadata associated with them so that you can directly implement these things. It's a wonderful set of resources. Do not start from scratch on this. We look around here again at the types of metadata that can go into. So this, if you're trying to uh, reverse engineer some of your systems and figure out what those relationships are. This is a great relationship for it. I'll also attach to the um, slides when I send this out a copy of the IBM Systems Journal article that describes this in greater detail as well, if you're interested in learning more about that. So all of these pieces allow us to get to a place where we can now start to talk about metadata as a capability rather than as a thing. It's even more difficult when we look at that thing versus capability difference and the data is semi-structured or as most unscrupulous vendors tell you, unstructured. We can take your unstructured data and turn it into structured data. Well, anybody says that to you, I would hand that individual a glass of water and say, please turn this into wine as well, because it's equally miraculous. The definition of unstructured, of course, is that there is no structure. But metadata does describe both structured and semi-structured information. A better way to describe this is tabular and non-tabular data, because it doesn't appear that you're making anything occur miraculously, which you are not. You're adding structure to something that already has structure, and that structure that you add, of course, is metadata. Metadata for semi-structure responds to a whole series of different requirements. And you can see out here, there are lots and lots of them. I'm gonna direct your attention specifically to the structural metadata. And if you haven't heard of something called Dublin Core, it is something that you absolutely should look up. Uh, the uh, Again, just a sad story. I'm the typical American geographically challenged, and I'm in uh, Belfast, Northern Ireland, and I'm hinting because I hadn't yet been to Dublin. And I'm trying to get somebody to invite me to come down to do a talk so I can see that wonderful city that I've heard so much. And somebody finally put up their hand and said, well, Dr. Aiken, the Dublin that you're looking for is actually in Ohio rather than in uh, the south of the uh, Republic of Ireland. But nevertheless, we still get you the invite to come on down here. So Metadata for semi-structured is even more critical than because when people say that they are structuring your unstructured data, they're adding metadata to that set. So let's look at these uh, again pieces here. These patterns yield valuable comparisons and starting points. Almost every type of thing in the entire world has been modeled in one form or another. And if you're having trouble finding it, we actually have banks that share metadata patterns back and forth because that does not necessarily represent collusion. We have all sorts of organizations and industries that are trying to get in there. If you work in the petroleum industry, the group PPDM has done a wonderful job producing a general map of what the oil and gas industry metadata looks like. Uh, again, it's not to say that it is going to be the thing that you have, but you do have something. So we can ask questions. Do we have to create a pharmacy billing system from scratch? And the answer is no. I go out and spend uh, a little bit of money and buy one of Len's books, import that model directly into my case tool, crank it out uh, so that we can create some DDL. And uh, we are actually up and running with a prototype in a very, very short amount of time uh, on this. Will the proposed software fit? It is now considered best practices to ask for vendors to provide you with a logical model of their data uh, inside their systems as a condition for bidding on a project. Organizations that don't provide the models don't get to bid on the project and you can use that to help weed out poorly run uh, metadata practices in there as well. Do industry pra best practices exist? Yes, I just described one to you, which is the idea that organizations should be getting this in. Uh, this has actually gotten as far as the federal government. This best practices is now implemented in law. And I'll talk to you about that in just a second. Has anybody promised a model, uh, excuse me, published a model implementing, I don't sure, GPPR, that should be GDPR. Uh, error there, I gotta catch that uh, in there. Yeah, and, and maybe not yet, okay, we haven't gone that far. So those are our four strategies that we're looking at. Let's talk about some benefits in particular. And there was one of our presidents a little while ago, uh, one that I happen to like, but he, he made a statement here that was a little bit uh, unnerving here. So they, 
according to the Electronic Future uh, Frontier Foundation, may or may not know about certain things. You can see they, they, you know that they rang a phone or you called from a particular location, but the president said, you don't have to worry, it's just metadata. Well, uh, no, uh, metadata is clearly quite valuable and we need the public to become more aware of this all the way around. I'm gonna show you now a little bit of an animation describing how one company decided to make a value proposition for itself. Company is called Invera. It had a really interesting typical story around this. <laughs> excuse me, but, <coughs> excuse me. The um, uh, proposition was, that they looked and said, hey, how do companies exchange information? And well, you've got your suppliers. You know, these are all the bits of information we go back and forth as we're conducting a transaction between these two. And of course, these transactions can be conducted by phone, fax, email, uh, electronic data interchange, XML, whatever it is that we're doing. Uh, but you can see, of course, that that becomes pretty complex pretty quick. And when you compare not just A and B back and forth, but A to C, A to D, and all the rest of it, it gets very complex very quickly. So Invera's value proposition was to eliminate all of this complexity and instead put itself into the center of this as a clearinghouse. They created the situation where you only needed to make one type of connection to company B and every connection that company A had with Invera was automatically accessible to company B. Now, not from a security perspective, but from a technology integration metadata perspective on this. And of course, this looks like a pretty good value proposition. There's lots of companies that are trying this as well. You'll see them in a number of different offerings that are popping out as organizations get clearer on this. And hopefully that gives you a little bit of the value. But of course, what was really important here is that Invera said, I'm not just simplifying what you're doing as you're going back and forth. Instead, what we're talking about is that this metadata allows us to build up and start doing planning and all sorts of other things that enable us to really significantly add value to the organization. I mentioned before the federal law that had recently been signed into effect. Uh, again, 114.19. Here's the law. Read it quick as it goes by. I'm just kidding. That's just a piece out there. But what's happened is that all federal data is now open by default. They are no longer allowed to put it in a PDF and say, good luck getting access to the data. They have to provide the metadata. It also requires agencies that work for the federal government to appoint non-political chief data officers that are completely separate from the CIO staff and to use open data and open models when doing performance evaluation. And the interesting part about this law is that if somebody violates this law, the penalties are higher than HIPAA. Now that's a really big, big lift. So metadata benefits increase the value of your strategic information, telling you what whether what you have in your warehouse is valuable or not. Uh, again, I just said warehouse, whatever your data collection is. It can be incredibly effective about reducing training costs and orienting people to the systems. It helps data-oriented research time by assisting the business analysts uh, doing this, providing documentation, improving communication between the business users and the IT professionals, helping organizations leverage decreasing your time to market, reducing risk of project failure, and identifying and reducing redundant data and processes all the way around. So we spent a better part of an hour here talking through some very, very rapid fire topics around metadata. We've defined metadata in the context of data management, had to define data management, of course, first, and say, what do we mean by using the data as metadata? And I hope you understand now it is a use of existing data as opposed to a type of data. I've given you a specific example using the music app from Apple that you can demo to any manager anywhere in five or 10 minutes to show them how you can use this. I've given you four specific strategies. Treat metadata as a gerund, not as a noun. Enforce metadata to be the language of data governance. Make sure that you treat glossary and repositories not as technology, but as capabilities. And I'm sure Jesse will reinforce that point when he gets back on here in just a second. And finally, our fourth strategy is build your metadata from the existing building blocks out there. There are lots and lots of resources around all of that. We've talked a little bit about the benefits and we're getting ready to do the takeaways. At the top of the hour, we will switch over to our Q&A. So, Takeaways, 
data about data is a good starting place, but make sure that people do get that second piece. It unlocks the value and therefore requires attention. Metadata is a lot less about what and more about how. Metadata must be the language of data governance and metadata defines the essence of almost all business challenges. And that your real value perspective question is, should we include this data item within the scope of our metadata practices? So we're getting right around to the top of the hour here. I'm gonna leave you all with some references and recommended re reading. And I also mentioned that I'm gonna include the IBM Systems Journal article in the package that comes out to you from Shannon when she sends you all of my slides and Jesse's slides uh, around this. And we are now up to the point I need to remind you that we've got a conference in person coming up, DGIQ. We will be meeting for the first time in almost two years uh, in San Diego, uh, very early in December. And that our next webinar coming up here are some prerequisites, what we call exercising the seven deadly data sins uh, on that. Got a couple book prices in here. Again, the data literacy book is out there on Amazon. If you look around, you'll find a 25% off coupon on that. And we are back to Shannon right at the top of the hour. Peter, thank you so much for another fantastic presentation. If you have questions for Peter or for Jesse, feel free to submit them in the Q&A portion of your screen. And again, just a reminder, I will be sending a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Thursday with links to the slides, the recording, as well as anything else requested throughout. As Peter mentioned, so Diving in here, so is the quote unquote which uh, instrument created the data or question not relevant for defining metadata? Is which question not relevant for defining metadata? Absolutely valid question. So what they're doing is they're looking at the six interrogatives that we've talked about and they are who, what, where, when, why, and how. I'll pop that slide up here as soon as I can jump to it. There we go uh, on that. And, and the question is, does which come into there? Well. It probably is a subset of this. If you look at journalism as a career field, uh, and the uh, gentleman that wrote the forward for the new data literacy book was the editor of Time Magazine for many years, and then the assistant secretary for misinformation, I like to call it that uh, on here. He, as an editor, if you look at a subject and you've answered the questions, who, how, where, when, why, and what, which probably comes in there as well, unless you're spelling it W-I-T-C-H. Jesse, any thoughts on that? Maybe it's just a Halloween joke. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'm, I'm going right back to the root of the question and it's, uh, is this? And the answer is always yes. Mm -hmm. Any metadata is good metadata. It just depends on how valuable it is. So, and, and as you said, Peter, uh, which oftentimes is a subset of one of these others. Um, but, it, you know, it, it depends on where you're asking the question. So, you know, some things that come to mind is, is that sometimes the same piece of metadata is created from different places. Um, and knowing where your metadata came from, which sometimes I think the witch is targeting, um, that can help you uh, weight your metadata or determine the value of your metadata or actually have a trust of your metadata when you're able to actually track the, the witch of um, that dimension of the metadata. And Jesse, for your um, products, it's fairly easy. If, an, if a business user says, I'm not gonna use it unless you put the witch question in there, that's something that you guys can handle, correct? Yeah, with the modeling platform of the semantic web built right into the knowledge graph, you have probably the most powerful modeling capabilities available to you. So if you needed to deactivate the how and activate or create a witch, absolutely would be able to do that for any flavor or type of asset that we were talking about. If you guys think about it, the guys that make metadata technologies like Jesse have to be operating at not just a metadata level, but a meta metadata level. And the answer he just gave there, of course, indicated exactly that. They thought about that and said, if somebody wants it, we'll be able to program it in there because, of course, the customer's always right. Right, Jesse? Yes, always. <laughs> All right, Shannon. <laughs> So uh, can you tell what's the difference between master data management and metadata management? Sure. Do you want to try that one first, Jesse? I'm going to let you take that, right. Peter, because I want to hear what you have to say first. I'm going to play right. off of you. 
So master data management is the idea that some things in your organization that create, that, that, that focus on the nouns uh, on that, uh, uh, the person, places, or things that the organization does. And that master data management is part of that data confusion that we talked about before. I like to call all of those challenges that organizations have the organizational data debt that they face, because it's not easy to untangle yourself from the existing mess so that you can take advantage of some of these wonderful technologies that we've been talking about. The idea, of course, within um, uh, looking around and trying to figure out what is master data and what is not is always a hard problem. So I don't like to tell organizations to say, get a definition of master data, but instead to say, master data is really a strategy. And the strategy is the idea that we're going to implement a bit of leverage in there such that master data, again, the data about Peter, right, is going to be uh, uh, influenced across all of the data that Peter has in the system. So again, I'm a big amazon.com customer, even though I pick on them from time to time, uh, but I live way, way out in the country. And so I get lots and lots of Amazon orders instead of taking the gasoline to go into the city. Uh, I'm not sure it's really cost-effective to get a pack of batteries delivered by a big uh, UPS truck, but you know that's at least seems to be the sense of it. And just quickly, Amazon is working specifically with metadata to try and group those deliveries into to fewer pieces. So if you're a little bit green like me and you want to try to do that, you can say, hey, my Amazon delivery can come on Friday. You can bring me all the things on Friday. Now, the idea, of course, is that math, meta, excuse me, master data does in some ways function as metadata. So there could be confusion between the two. Uh, we did a, Shannon and I did a, a um, presentation on meta, uh, master data uh, one or two times ago. If you go to the YouTube channel, you'll see, uh, you can look it up pretty, pretty easily on this. But Think about that. In other words, med master data is kind of controlling that other data. It's again saying these things are Peter's bits that he's bought from Amazon. And by the way, I have an author's page at Amazon too. So I have a couple different relationships with Amazon. But if you think about master data, there's something even more controlling than that. And that's reference data. Now we always talk about them in the same breath because they work in exactly the same ways. And I'm gonna use a, an example here that's kind of been in the news, so at least a lot of, uh, uh, um, uh, school board hearings around it, uh, at least in my part of the world uh, out here. So if we're going to say that gender is only going to have two valid values uh, in there, that's reference data. And that means that if somebody changes from one value to another value, they cannot. So that reference data actually acts as a control on master data. And again, provides the same leverage around this. So reference and master data are both in some ways, some types of subsets of metadata and function somewhat alike them, but they are very different in terms of the strategies uh, on there. And the metadata, uh, excuse me, the master data stuff is something that we've had a lot of uh, organizations try to build technology around and hasn't worked out quite as well as it should. But nevertheless, does it make sense to get a hold of the things, the list of vendors that you have, the list of customers that you have, the list of products that you have, and have them managed out of one place? Generally, yes. Um, we didn't used to call it master data, but we've now moved into because just as Jesse was saying before, some technologies have provided us some really nice technologies that we can uh, take advantage of and really exploit to a much greater degree on that. Did I leave you anything, Jesse? Yeah, well, I, I liked how you started. It's all part of the confusion. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think it's almost fair to say uh, we could combine any one of the words, data, metadata, master data, reference data, and use the, that old saying, right? And one man's data is another man's metadata. You can say that between any one of those combinations. One person's reference data is another's master, and master is a meta. And it's just part of the confusion. And sometimes it may be because of a piece of software that almost has established a culture um, but it's, it, do, it, it will do you well to clear out some of that confusion and just leverage any of this kind of stuff that you can for a value, whether somebody's calling it master or reference or meta or data or whatnot, isn't necessarily as important as the value that you're getting out of your content. 
And I would add one more piece that I just thought of, which is that, of course, if you're trying to implement uh, master data, it's virtually impossible to do if you don't have good control of your metadata practices. So yeah. uh, certainly run. Uh, Shannon, I think Jesse just invented a new game for us at EDW. What do you think? I love it. <laughs> yeah, we could do word, word combinations. Maybe we could do it with Twister, right? <laughs> All kinds of games we got planned. I got a master data green over here, so that's your right elbow, right? <laughs> Uh, so moving on, to the, um, what is your opinion of business process models as metadata? Oh, absolutely. Uh, once again, the existence of a business process architecture component is a wonderful piece of metadata that you can say, yes, we have some, even organizations that have some is a wonderful thing. I can tell you that of the thousands of organizations that I have literally worked with over the past 40 years, one in 10 tries to do this. And that from a process modeling perspective, it's sad because uh, again, just following up on the last question, if you try to implement master data without understanding your process architecture of your organization, you will not succeed. Uh, and I have seen so many organizations neglect that particular step. They think it's just something they can put into the system and it'll run. No, it has to be engineered. You have to purposely try to obtain that leverage that we're talking about uh, in that. Jesse, yeah. over to you. Yeah, bring it to life. Let it affect workflows, um, processes, policies, issues, requirements. Uh, bring it to life. Let it be part of your model. Let it become part of your metadata um, and then drive, uh, drive other aspects off of it for sure. And of course, your product handles all of that type of uh, work integrated seamlessly, correct? Yeah, because of the modeling, uh, mm -hmm. even back to the original question, you know, without coding, without having to do some sort of like deep business logic, it's part of the ontology modeling, we call it ontology, just a fancy word for model schema if you will, but with the graph nature, uh, Peter, you, we have that flexibility and the tooling built right in to just drive the model and let the model drive the rest of the system, even the APIs. And again, you can see here on this particular model, we have included links for process components that go into here. Of course, if you were working in a case tool environment, you would have the process and the data pieces interrelated via a CRUD matrix. Uh, again, something is not taught in schools anymore, but is certainly a valuable component. Uh, sounds like you've had experience with those as well, Jesse. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, the, the you know that that's where sometimes the experience matters, and um, definitely start from learning from others and and what's available. Absolutely, great question. Thank you. How do I make others in organization understand and see the value in what we do about? metadata. I love this question. We, we, as you know, Peter, we get variations of this question all the time in, in our webinars. And the value is a portion that we've neglected to illustrate to our students as they're learning these topics. So they think just doing them for the sake of doing them is correct. And generally it is. But if you're in an organization, you're almost always in some sort of constrained resource perspective. So the first thing I would do is to go back and actually run a little demo with them here where you take some music, find, find a CD, find a CD player, put it in there and say, this would really suck if I was trying to manage my music off of the screen. It just doesn't do anything. If I'm trying to find one particular song, am I supposed to remember that it's track 18 or the longest track? By the way, in here, you can also click on these things and uh, it'll sort them in order. So, you know, you could sort them by the longest time, but you can see the value of metadata is that when we've taken that input and now we don't have to go back and everybody has to link to all of these various bits and pieces. Instead, we can now say, oh, just stick the CD into the player. And all of a sudden, all of the, uh, the metadata shows up along with it. Uh, if that's not businessy enough for them, there are lots and lots of examples in a little book that I put together called Monetizing Data Management. There are 17 examples of the use of metadata and value in particular. It's just absolutely critical to make sure that you do include that value uh, component in there because people look at this and if they don't understand it, they will perceive you as a cost and you won't get anywhere. Jesse, how do you guys help customers realize the value out of that? If, if they come knocking with a specific use case, it's usually identifying what, what is the value that the others are going to see, 
right? So whenever someone comes knocking and they say, look, we've got this kind of data, this is our scenario, our goal is this, but are other people going to see it? That's what we have to bring to light. And it's, it's surprising how quickly people do see it, but you have to put something like, uh, you know, with their data, that's usually a key part, right? Not, not just mock data. And if it is mock data, it's got to be something like this iTunes example, something that everyone gets and it's very clear. But if you can do it with their data in their scenario, that's what will usually, you know, get someone over the hill and actually, and, you know, to be able to see it and little things matter, you know, showing the, the search ability, the reusability, the reference ability, um, the little things tend to matter. And if you can do a practical demo, like Peter said, but with their content, it's even that much better. And if they need to see the witch, show them the witch, right? Yeah. Sometimes executives are focused on these things and that's the answer. So yes, that's the way we go. Okay. Thanks again. Great question. So is it necessary that uh, we have software solution to maintain metadata? Well, one of the things that's fun is to introduce young students to the idea of managing a many-to-many -many relationship. And of course, they quickly figure out that if you have more than 100 things connected back and forth to 100 other things, it's almost impossible to measure with any code or anything else that goes into this. Uh, so the, the idea, of course, is to say within the constructs of what you're trying to do, how should we best do it? And you might put something together. And I showed you an example of one that's pretty easy to put together. Again, I've literally given you everything you need in this uh, example here, including the underlying data model to build this little repository out of access. Um, you can build it. It'll take you, you know, a couple of days to knock together, a couple more days to populate and you'll start to work with it. Of course, we all know that Microsoft Access was never designed to be a real production database uh, in there. And by the way, here's another little interesting piece of metadata. I had an organization that did an inventory of their Microsoft Access databases that were running in production and found the number was upwards of 400,000. And then they decided they wanted to get rid of each of them, which was probably a really good idea from a governance perspective. So it took them almost 10 years, but they got rid of every single one of the 400 plus thousand Microsoft Access production databases. Now, again, I could you could produce one of these. I would suggest that the, the real reason for producing something like this is to help sell the concept conceptually. And in that sense, you really don't necessarily need to make a functioning prototype uh, on this. If you're just trying to sell the boss's boss on this, um, just showing them that they can go in and get access to it and having business people say, yes, that piece of technology will be very useful to my business operations is usually enough to make them uh, sign the check and get, get started on the process. Again, remember in all cases, you're not adding new things. You're buying, you're buying some technology that's going to help you to reduce your data debt. And that data debt comes in a number of forms, but one of them is usually insufficient attention to metadata management and metadata practices in there. So yes, you could build them I mean, again. You, you guys should all be able to build this thing uh, from the information that I've given you here, but I'm suggesting that the idea of using that should be done as a way of trying to create a model such that you can show your people who um, uh, produce the checks uh, out of this on the other end of this, um, that this will be a valuable piece uh, in order to do this. You can, I have seen organizations run on, on homegrown metadata management solutions. Um, the real problem with this is that this runs on the old relational database technology and it's not able to incorporate the knowledge graph components that Jesse has. So you could sort of get started and build one of these things, but you'll never get to anything like Jesse can show you if you give him a, a few minutes to really show you a demo about this and, and, and see how the knowledge graph works. It's just a fundamentally different approach to managing this. And Jesse, maybe you want to elaborate on that point. I just want to say yes. You know, <laughs> but I'm jo yeah, so joking. So, yeah. you know, the, do, do you need software um, at some point? Yes, but don't let the software just make the debt unmanageable. So get what is right for the job for what you're trying to accomplish. Um, don't buy today because you needed something today. Buy tomorrow or next week after you've evaluated the, the real inputs to the, the situation that you have today. 
So do your research, know what you're after. And, you know, and then, yes, as, as Peter said, there are, you know, there are very flexible solutions like knowledge graphs available to you um, that can grow with you and it without forcing you into a rigid approach um, like the like something that's backed by a relational model. So we believe in the knowledge graph approach, the semantic standards. And I, I threw in that comment earlier, I, I think during my talk, you know, non-black box, yep. you want to be able to know what's going on. You want to be able to have the control and do the things like add the witch if you need to. And, and Jesse, can you, with this example or anything that I've shown here, give a contrasting way of how this would be more flexible using the knowledge graph? Because I have not built that example yet. Maybe that'd be something we ought to collaborate on to. Um... Yeah, uh, immediately being able to um, inherit characteristics. So uh, an ontology modeling approach just in the model alone representing this would allow me to simplify this down a lot and inherit common characteristics, common constraints on those characteristics, a common understanding by the machine of those characteristics down through the model. So it would actually, even though the word ontology sometimes is terrifying to people, it's actually a much simpler, cleaner approach. So I could inherit a lot of characteristics down through this um, and capture these details and then drive validation mechanisms, drive the capture of the metadata. Um, and then we could start layering things like inferencing and rules over top of it to make it even that much smarter and that much more connected, but without you having to be involved with every step. Exactly. Again, try to do that in this type of a model here. This is your basics. This is where you start. This is sort of the 101 thing. But where organizations are truly obtaining value now is to convert to the knowledge graphs and working it from that direction. Yeah. Thanks, Jesse. Great. Great answer there. So uh, do you know, and, and we could probably do a whole webinar. I think we've done a whole webinar, Peter, on this. Uh, any best practice metadata frameworks? Um, well, so uh, again, this piece right here, if you're going to build the traditional old repository for storing metadata information about your data, this is it. I mean, this is really the core that you're looking at right here. Uh, again, I'll put that that paper uh to blank and there's a, a little bit easier to read version that looks a little bit like this, but the best practices really evolve around organizational use of data. So it's not to say that, um, again, this is a terrible statement to make, um, but I, I, it's a true story. So I feel obligated to let you guys know. Um, one of the places where my retirement, uh, you can tell I'm a little closer to retirement perhaps than some of the rest of you, uh, uh, is stored, has owned a metadata repository for the past 15 years. They've never broken the shrink wrap on the product. I've been brought in by the vendor several times. I've sat with these folks and said, please, I have lots of my retirement with you. I think this would be a really good thing for you to do. Unfortunately, their attitude is we get surveyed once a year by the banking regulators and they want to know if we've purchased a metadata model. The answer is yes, we have purchased a metadata model. And that's it. They've never done anything with it. It just drives me crazy. So that's clearly not best practices in there. And, and the, the starting point on this is really not that hard. It's finding out what are your knowledge workers spending time doing. Some of your knowledge workers will be doing things that are uh, related to IT. Some of them will not. The example that I gave earlier on were the people that are doing the wiring or the networks in your organization. Find those folks and get them to tell what would happen to the organization if somebody stopped keeping people from accessing your networks and learning about various dropping points and all the rest of the things that go into that. Uh, lots and lots of, of bits around that. But as far as a codifying a best practice, the closest that we've gotten to are things like the BIMBOC, uh, the uh, DCAM in some instances, there's a, a couple of other uh, reference publications. Uh, one of them is the uh, Controlled Unclassified Information. Um, I forget what the acronym for that is, that's been put out by the National Archives of all people. Uh, and once again, the back to the Dublin Core, if you are storing information on documents and you don't start with the Dublin Core, shame on you because they've got literally hundreds of years of research uh, into that and they have come up with the best way to do it, which as you might imagine is implemented in most libraries worldwide. Uh, Jesse, am I missing anything on the, the best practices score? The, Recently, what I've been noticing some people mean whenever they come up and say, what do you have a framework? Um, 
they're looking for things like even just codifying what are the names of the stewards, business steward, data steward, application steward, subject matter expert, the racy matrix, those kinds of things. So putting roles and parties in place, documenting their policies and procedures, making their 500 page document referenceable, you know, you know, being able to say because 12.3.34 says so, being able to get a framework started, um, what we call with top rate edge, our, our knowledge graph, we call that executive governance. Um, and it's a, what we call top down approach, putting the framework in place with a lot of people. When I hear that language, they're actually after the, how do I get started? And they're interested in what kind of roles should they have? What kind of policies, what kind of procedures, what kind of workflows? Um, do they have an issue tracker? And some of it's a single solution. Sometimes it's a multi-software solution. Um, but I, at, a lot of times when I'm hearing that recently, it's a, how do I get started? I need a framework. Um, and they're not even ready to start talking about metadata. They're talking about it from a distance. They're, they're stiff arming it, the, the, the metadata saying, I'm not ready for it yet. I need to start with a framework. And it's funny because it's, it's really just the who, what, where, how, when, and whys and whiches of the process that you need to start capturing. Who are the who's? Who are the key who players? Are what are the, exactly. yeah. And exactly. then you've got a framework in place if you start using that metadata language just in a pre-metadata kind of scenario. We're not quite ready yet is what you hear a lot, but actually you'll find that most organizations are actually doing it to some degree. I've yes. never failed to walk into an organization and find somebody over in the corner who says, now don't tell IT that I've got the SQL server instance under my desk, but I've actually mapped out the entire marketing area and, and can track uh, every, all the data we get from MailChimp uh, comes into here. And we do, you know, analytics that make MailChimp look uh, uh, like a, a very primitive organization. And, you know, my answer is always twofold. One, IT always knows about your instance and they keep it around because they understand it's valuable. Um, they'd love for you to come in and, and integrate with the rest of the thing, but that's not a number one priority right now, which is why you're allowed to still be doing this. So you'll find somebody in your organization that's doing something wonderful with data uh, in that sense. And it's always almost always a, an application of metadata. Um, so we are closing to Halloween here and, and I urge organizations to have a data horror uh, meeting. Just you know, say, hey, come here, tell us stories. And again, make sure you're not broadcasting this live over Facebook uh, and telling the rest of the world, but, but you know, look at your, your specific problems and figure out what size data debt that you have and whether metadata solutions are going to be in your future or not. And uh, in almost all the cases, it's going to be there. I love it. There's so many puns in there for Halloween data that I just... Uh, terrible <laughs> they're at the ready there's a, there's a saying leave leave the comedy to the professionals right <laughs> well i think we have time for one more question here uh so um you indicated that 80 percent of the organization data is rot given that case does that mean we eliminate the rot or do we stratify it as a lower priority lower priority for starters uh, on that. The elimination of 80% of your data, if you think about it, would result in one fifth the cost of your, uh, of your uh, infrastructure that's storing the data, whether it's cloud-based or whatever. And remember, cloud only scales linearly, so you don't get the economies of scale that you used to when you had the wonderful server farms that you'd made an investment in. Uh, and so that's a, a, a new reality that organizations have to think about. But the, the other part of this, is to say within where organizations are really trying to gain value, it's just exactly like the marketing. Everybody knows that half of all advertising dollars are wasted, but nobody knows which half. And that's the same problem with this as well. If you don't have good metadata practices, you'll have no idea whether this is the golden source as it would be in the master data management set or the uh, you know, source that was most recently accessed by the customer or whatever the, the particular pieces that you're looking for. Metadata is integral to that process. Jesse, any thoughts on that? No, and and rot can come in a <laughs> rot can come in a lot of different forms, um, and it it may be it may do you well to even add uh, if you've got a flexible modeling capability, especially like a knowledge graph approach, um, you can you can categorize and and determine what kinds of characteristics, what of the hows, who, whats, wheres, and whens are actually identifying possible rot. 
Um, so any metadata is good metadata, even if it's temporarily rot, because yep. you may learn something from it. So it, it, I, I, don't, I don't think Peter was saying throw it away, but identify it, look at it, and then determine how to optimize. But was, is that the case, Peter? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Yeah, no, Peter told me to come in here and throw away one in every fifth data record. So we're just going to go, <laughs> I'm sorry, four out of five data records. <laughs> we'll have fun with that one. Yeah. Shannon, do we have coverage on insurance? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Peter. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, thank you both for this great presentation. It's really, it's really been great. And uh, thanks to Top Quadrant for sponsoring today's webinar and helping to make these webinars happen. We really appreciate it. Uh, and just to note, again, a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to everybody by end of day Thursday with links to the slides and links to the recording of this webinar along with the additional information. So, and thanks all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do, really appreciate it. And we hope to see you next month as Peter has the schedule up there. Okay. Schedule up there and hope to see all of you in December or uh, March, depending on uh, which, uh, which event you're going to come to. But we are definitely back in the saddle, if you will. I love it. It's exciting. <laughs> all right. Jesse, thank you so much. We really appreciate thank you participating Peter. today. Yes, thank you and Shannon. Thank you both. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great day. Cheers, everybody. Bye-bye.